Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. In 1897, a group of believers were meeting in the Perry Township Schoolhouse on St. John's Road when the school board decided to kick this little group of believers out. They got together with a man by the name of Clarence Mitchell who helped them choose leaders within the congregation and thus on July the 4th, 1897, Rouskop Church of Christ was born. One acre of ground was donated to this little congregation by some people within the congregation. And that was at the corner of St. John's Road and Amherst Road. And thus they began building their first church building. It was slow going because they were elderly people and the professions and the time that they had. But they eventually got the building up. And then 50 years later, they hired their first part-time minister to serve them. In 1951, they decided that they needed to expand, and so they began building a basement just to the south of that building, which would then house a fellowship hall, a baptistry, a Sunday school classrooms, and maybe the most amazing thing for them, flush toilets. Then in 1961, 10 years later, they decided to build on top of that building. And thus in April of 1962, we come to this worship center that we now have. This was dedicated in April of 1962. Then in the summer of 1991, under the ministry of Ivan Lavalle, they bought a little bit more acres just to the south of them and began constructing new additions onto the current building, and that was completed in 1995. So tomorrow, July the 4th, 2022, happy 125th birthday to Roscop Church of Christ. Today we continue with our current series, Abraham's Journey of Faith, which takes place within the epic journey. Now, it might seem like we're going kind of slow through this right now, but Genesis is a very narrative, story-like book. There's a lot of stories in Genesis that are the foundation for the rest of the Bible. And we'll read about several of these things as you go through the Bible, even into the New Testament. So it's important that we get these stories, plus there's a lot that we can learn from them. And today's scripture is particularly relevant. So today we're going to recognize three important aspects of history. First of all, tomorrow, July the 4th, 2022, will be the 246th birthday of our nation. Tomorrow will also be the 125th birthday of Roscoff Church of Christ. And the other aspect that we're looking at today is that Abram will have a son. And he will be at the age of 100 years old when this takes place. Now there's a common thread that runs through all three of these historical events. And that is that none of them come easy. There's a struggle in all good things that happen. Therefore, our point is that all good things come with a cost. All good things come with a cost. For example, concerning our nation, our forefathers, many of them fought and died or sacrificed greatly for the founding of this nation to fight, to get free from the motherland or to fight off other countries or fight for more territories. They fought a bloody civil war. In the 20th century, some of you and, or maybe your parents or grandparents fought in many of the wars in that century. And then we've also had wars in this century, in the 21st century. But today, the main war that we fight is a war of worldview, as many in this country are leaving the faith. 
Many don't believe in God anymore. They're, they're questioning whether God is relevant or not. And so that is the modern war that we fight. Concerning the congregation, uh, the people that established it had hard-fought battles to fight as far as to get things accomplished, to raise money, to come up with enough funds and money. And, and many of the things they did back then, they built things themselves. They didn't hire it done. They did it themselves. So a lot of time went into this. The cost of building projects is, is always expensive, no matter when it is, whether in the history or whether it's current. Ladies have labored in their ladies groups and individual ladies have labored and worked to make things happen. There was a time period when it was mostly ladies that held the little congregation together. Men have worked hard and men have sat in board meetings and, and had sharp disputes that they've had to work through. Preachers have come and gone and one of these days I'll be gone and hopefully and prayerfully the church will still be here, this congregation and some other minister will lead at that time. And the scripture that we're going to be reading today of Abraham and Sarah's struggles through, through this 25 years of waiting on a son, they went through a lot of trials and hard times until they finally got a son. And we're going to look at the fact that freedom is not free. Even though the word free is in freedom, it comes with a cost. And we're going to be looking at some of these costs today. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we read how that God made a covenant with Abram. God told Abram to get three animals, split them down the middle, lay them out on the ground, the halves opposite each other, and then God himself walked between those halves as a covenant promise that he would give Abram a son, that his descendants would become a great nation and they would inherit the land that Abram was at at that time. But that covenant really required nothing of Abram. The covenant that we're going to talk about today requires something of Abram. It is the covenant of circumcision. The covenant of circumcision. So let's begin reading in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is a covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Now for me, I'm really excited today because I no longer have to call Abram by that name. He is now Abraham. God has changed his name, and you don't realize how difficult it's been for me to say Abram all this time. And now I'm going to make the mistake of calling him Abram when he's supposed to be called Abraham. So bear with me. God came to Abram to restate this covenant promise that he would make him into a great nation. Now in chapter 16 that we read last week, he was 86 years old when we left him. Today, he is 99 years old. So when we read the Bible and it seems like God is always talking to these people, he wasn't. There's great numbers of years usually between the times that God talked to them and they would start to wonder are things going to happen uh, why is God seem to be so slow when really this was God's timing we want things to move along faster God is very very patient so let's go to verse 9 then God said to Abraham as for you you must keep my covenant you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. 
This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you must be, shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, and including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God is telling Abraham here that he and all of his offspring, anyone in his house that he's bought or is a servant, anyone born in the house, all the males must be circumcised. Now, what is circumcision? What is the cutting off of the male foreskin? Now, for adult men, this is a painful process, which is maybe why God said, let's do it to babies. Still painful, but at least the babies wouldn't be able to remember the painful process. Years later, Jacob's son misused circumcision in a very unholy way. Jacob had 12 sons, but he had a daughter by the name of Dinah. Dinah was raped by Shechem, and Shechem wanted then to marry Dinah. Jacob's son said, very well, you can marry our sister if you and all the males, all the men in your village are circumcised. And the men all agreed to do it. After they were circumcised, three days later, when the Bible says the men were still in great pain, Jacob's sons went in and killed all of the men. Thus, too painful to really fight in a battle because of circumcision. But they used this in a very, very wrong way. From this point on in Israel's history, God required circumcision of all these males, whether born into Israel as an Israelite or brought in as their servants or slaves. So how serious was God concerning this command? Well, we go to Moses. God called on Moses through the burning bush to return back to Egypt and to lead the Israelite people out. So Moses and his wife and two sons were heading back to Egypt and God was about to kill Moses. We asked why? Because he had not circumcised his two sons. And his wife hurriedly took and circumcised their two sons, and God relented from killing Moses. God takes circumcision extremely seriously. Verse 15. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. So God changed Sarai's name to Sarah. And I am really happy if I can just remember to keep calling them now Abraham and Sarah. But most importantly in this passage has nothing to do with me. It is the fact that God assures Abraham that this son that he is to have will not be through Ishmael, Hagar and Abram's, Abraham's son, but it will be through Abraham and Sarah's son yet to be born. But this is going to be a miracle because when we go to chapter 18 of Genesis, we learn that Sarah is beyond childbearing years. Her, her womb is not fertile anymore. So this is going to be a miracle of God for her and Abraham to have a son. And when that son arrives, Abraham is going to be 100 years old and Sarah is going to be 90 years old. But God assures Abraham that the covenant promise comes through Sarah and his seed, Isaac, will be their son. Let's skip to verse 23. 
on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God told them. Abraham lost no time. Probably very anxious that it seems that this son of his and Sarah's is going to be coming soon. So probably very anxious to get this circumcision process done and get on with the possibilities of having a son by Sarah. We need to ask ourselves a question though. Why is this so important? Why are we talking circumcision? Well, because throughout the Old Testament, from this point forward, and even into the New Testament, circumcision is often mentioned in the Bible. And so it's important to understand when it came about and why it came about. It marks God's covenant with Abraham. It marks what Abraham and the people need to do, the Israelite people need to do, to stay in line with God. Now, this, this is only just a small part of it, but, but this is the covenant promise on Abraham's part. And circumcision was no small matter. And maybe it's a, a, an inconvenience to the guys, but it was taken very seriously by God. So, let's talk a little bit about life. I mean, this is what this is all coming down to. There is a cost to freedom, as we saw with our nation, as we, as we see the, the freedoms that we have in this congregation to be here yet today. There's a cost to freedom even in God. I know we're saved by grace, we're saved because of what God does, but there's still responsibilities that we need to go through, we need to uh, have done or do in order to maintain a free relationship with God. Life can be rough. Sometimes it downright stinks. Now, I don't know a whole lot about sailing, except I, I know this from watching TV and hearing people talk. Sometimes the sea or the lake is as smooth as glass. No wind whatsoever. And a sailboat cannot function when there's no wind. A sailboat depends upon wind to move about. And then other times we know that there are gale force winds or hurricane force winds. And of course we know that is destructive to a sailboat. So when does a sailboat work the best? Well, when the winds are someplace in between calm and too windy. And that's what most of sailboating takes place. Most of the time with the weather, there is a breeze, a wind of some sort. So... Doesn't that describe life, though? Sometimes our life is just tranquil, maybe a little bit boring, that there are times we get bored and we need to do something. Maybe we'll go to a movie or maybe we'll eat out. We'll go to an amusement park for a little bit more excitement or maybe jump out of an airplane with a, with a parachute, of course. We do things to bring about some excitement when things get too boring. Sometimes, however, though, life has us by the tail, swinging us around, and we're out of control because of the catastrophes of life, and we're, we're in a hurricane of life situations. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Could, could be diseases, could be deaths, it could be jobs, it could be stress, it could be family issues. Those storms of life that's just a little bit too much for us. And just like the sailboat, most of the time, life goes on somewhere in between boring and that of being too exciting, too much going on. We live in a fallen world because of Adam and Eve's sin. So things are going to happen to us. And there are times that we will experience extreme problems. Life puts us through hard times. Some of these hard times come from God as tests to help strengthen us. Sometimes, most of the time, I could dare say, they come from Satan as temptations to get us to turn from God, to get us to just get so disgusted with God that we'll curse at him and say, I, I give up, I'm turning away, I want nothing more to do with God. But whether from God or whether from Satan, the whole idea, though, is how do we respond? How do we 
react to this? Are we able to turn something very bitter into something good? Are we able to get through the storm? Abraham and Sarah wanted a son, but they would have to carry out God's decrees, God's rules in order to have that son. And in this case, it was circumcision. We get into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and we see there was a lot of rules that God demanded that they needed to keep. And then there was the building of the tabernacle and how to worship and all these things. So we see that God requires quite a bit. And when we, when we respond in the right way to God, love and obedience, things usually go pretty good with Him, and He gives us freedoms. But when we stop obeying God and we stop loving Him, we start losing those freedoms and things start going worse than ever. Many people are asking, well, why circumcision? Why did God require that? Well, I didn't study it exclusively, but the few scholars that I read, the few books that I read, nobody really has a clue. They, they speculate. They say, well, maybe it's because of this or maybe it's because of this, but nobody really knows. And so it's just one of those things that the Israelites had to obey, such as many things today. There are things that we have to obey, even though to us, it doesn't make sense. What we have to understand, though, is freedom comes with a cost. Freedom comes with a cost. Freedom is not free. Just as our forefathers fought and died for freedom, the many wars, the many battles, but there were other things they went through also. They had to, they had to clear the land. They, they went through droughts and floods and plagues. They went through all kinds of hardships and trials that, the, that just the life situation threw at them. Just as the founders of our congregation went through for over the past 125 years, the, the hard times that they would go through at times. And, but they fought through them. Freedom comes with a cost. And freedom came with a cost for Abraham and Sarah with the rules and so forth that God put before them, especially this time when God said, Abraham, you and all the males must be circumcised. But how do we respond to these troubles in life? How do we respond to these hurricanes or these inconveniences of life? Well, we face them and we learn from them. In the book of James, after describing some problems, James says in chapter 4, verse 8, he, he writes, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now this passage does not say that we're going to escape problems. It tells us how to handle the problems. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and we learn wisdom, and we gain strength. Maybe not the physical strength, but we gain mental and spiritual strength from this. It is no fun, but it is essential. You might ask, well, how does this work? Well, most of my life I spent in farming. And farming, for one thing, you've got to be dedicated to it. You can't just decide to skip work for a day when there's work to be done. You've got to be there. You got to get out of bed every day and you got to go take care of the, the chores, whether it's feeding livestock or work the fields or whatever it is around the farm. You've got to do your work. So that's one aspect. The other aspect of farming is that you're at the mercy of the weather. You have to farm when the weather is right for whatever it is that you are doing. And it seems that every time that I invested, my, my wife and I, when we would invest heavily, the following year was a major disaster. Such as one year we bought a farm. The next year was the worst drought that I hope that I ever see in my life. And we could not make a farm payment. And for weeks I laid awake at night worrying about what are we going to do. I finally went into the loan officer and I said, we can't make a payment. There's nothing. And he explained, you and all the other farmers, everybody's in the same boat. Now that was before the days of crop insurance. It's a different story now with, with the help of insurance on things. There was another time that we invested heavily because we expanded the operation to a great deal. And so we had a heavy equipment debt. 
that year it wouldn't stop raining. It wouldn't slow down raining. It just kept going and going and it got later and later and later. And that year too, we could not make any payments on our equipment. There again, they said, just, just hang on. And we made it through it. Amazingly, one night that year, I went to bed, went to sleep, thinking we're done. We're bankrupt. There is no way out of this. But we made it through. And by making it through, I, I can say that God has never let me down. Now, now, let me clarify that. Even if we had gone bankrupt, I would still say that God never let me down because he would have got us through that somehow. He would have still sustained us. We would have drawn near to him and he would have drawn near to us. God will sustain us even when we're having the most horrible time of our lives. But he's strengthening us. He's making us stronger. All of those trying times that we face, God is working on growing us. So when we say that we grow in wisdom and strength spiritually or mentally, we mean that. God is strengthening us. So ask yourself the question, what extreme difficulty have you been through in the past and then years later had to go through a similar situation? How did it go the second time in comparison to the first time? And hopefully... The second time, even though still painful, went a whole lot better. Maybe that first time you were overwhelmed and despondent. You, you, just, you just kind of blew a fuse. But maybe the second time you resolved, I will stay in control. I will stay on top of this because now I know how to handle it. I've got experience and I've got maturity. Maybe that first time you were angry. Angry at your spouse, angry at the world, angry at everybody. And the second time, years later, you decided, I am in control. There's no need to get angry on this. We'll get through this one step at a time. Maybe you had a nervous breakdown that first time or near to it. And the second time you decided, no, we can do this. Maybe you needed someone to lead you through it the first time. You just couldn't handle it yourself. Maybe it was a parent or a friend or somebody else experienced and they, they come along beside you and they say, come on, I'll, I'll show you how to do this. And maybe the second time, years later, you were that one that helped lead someone else through it or led your family through it. We learn from this experience. Maybe the first time you got angry with God, maybe you cursed God. And the second time you decided, I will not do that. God got me through it the first time. He will see it, me through it the second time. So you see how we, we grow spiritually we, and we get strength from these things? We get experience and we know how to handle them the next time with the right attitude. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 tells us, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now the Bible is not saying that the problems are good for you. We're not saying that this is good that you're in a problem, in a major catastrophe. We're not saying that at all. What the Bible is saying, what Paul is saying, is that with the right attitude, you and I can find some good that comes from this major problem. I'll give you some examples. I lost my wife to cancer. Was it good that she got cancer and died? No way. I miss her every single day. But did good come from it? Absolutely. Although at the time I couldn't see it. I learned what cancer is. I learned how to be the spouse of someone with cancer. I saw what she went through. And now today in ministry, this has helped me so much. I had heart disease. I thought at one time I was going to die. But today when, when you go into a major illness or whatever, Maybe it's cancer, maybe it's heart, maybe it's something else. I've got experience of hospital calls and, and, and how to hopefully comfort people. And with many people, if they've got cancer or heart disease, and I walk in, they know that at least I've got an inkling of what they're going through. Maybe I don't understand it completely, but I've got an idea. There's a, there's a bonding there. And prior to heart disease and cancer, 
I didn't want to go to the hospital and visit people. I, it was the farthest thing from my mind. But now, I, I don't want to say I enjoy it, but I'm not afraid of it. And I go there to minister, to help and to serve people. Maybe you've gone through the same thing, and if you've lost a loved one or you've gone through a major illness, help others get through it now that you know what it's like. Maybe you lost your job or a business, and I've talked to people that have gone through that, and at the time it was the worst part of their lives, but years later they said, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Why? Because they said, I'm better off now than I would have ever had that not happened. They said, I would still be in that job or in that business, but I'm better off now that I lost it. Is it good that your child rebelled? Uh, well, no, we, we don't want to ever say that. But you know, most of us, most all of us at some point go through a little bit of rebellion in our lives. Whether it's as an adolescent or a teenager or a young adult or a middle-aged adult, there's a certain amount of Rebellious, rebelliousness in us that we go through. And maybe it's good that your child rebelled now as hard as it was for you, but hopefully they came back to you and back to Christ and got through that stage and now they're, they're plowing forward doing good. Is it good that your parents had an addiction to whatever it was? Well, well no, not at all. But maybe you saw that you're not going to get addicted to anything or what they've been addicted to or anything else because you saw the destruction that it did to the family. So good can come from a variety of things. But while we're in it, man, it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to get through it. But we persevere in God. So we ask ourselves the questions. What good came of Abraham and Sarah going through 25 years of waiting on that son. Well, there's several good things that came from it. They learned to trust God. They learned to have faith in God. They learned patience. They learned perseverance. They learned that God's ways are better than their ways. They learned that God keeps his promises. And see, God teaches us all the same things when we go through these trials. We can, we can look back, usually it's after we go through them, that we can look back and we see the good that came from it because God was teaching us. Another thing we can see from Abraham and Sarah is that they could not see the big picture. They were only seeing what was in front of their eyes. They at the time couldn't see the destruction, the, the problems that it would cause for Abraham to have this sexual relationship with with Hagar so that they could have this son which wasn't part of God's promise whatsoever. See, they couldn't see the big picture. They only saw the small part and they tried to fix things their way. It just doesn't work that way because God can see the big picture. Sometimes you and I can't see the big picture either. That day that you lost your car keys and made you late for that appointment, how do you know that God didn't keep you out from being on the road when that drunk crossed over the center line. That day that you overslept and you were disgusted and you're hurrying around to, to get to where you were going, uh, how do you know that God didn't keep you out of an intersection where someone ran the red light or ran the stop sign and kept you safe? Tomorrow is the 4th of July and many people will be heading to the beaches and, and pools. And maybe you're going to be sick tomorrow. One of your kids are going to be sick. And everybody's disappointed and they're disgusted and some kids are mad because you can't go now. How do you know that God didn't save someone's life? It's possible that your family was going to go and someone might have drowned. See, you and I cannot see the big picture, but God can. And we have to trust God. Freedom comes with a cost. And there's all kinds of reasons why we, we can't have the freedom that we want to do things as we want because God sees the big picture. God sees how he needs to help refine us. We are the clay, the soft clay, the putty. God shapes us. And see, there's, a, there's another aspect of 
coming to God and being part of his body. The, the church is the body of Christ. And we come together and we meet. We said that this congregation tomorrow will be 125 years old. And we gather together as a group. And everybody is different. Some people are the, of the body. Some people are the, the feet. Some people are the hands. Some people the eyes, the ears, and, and different parts of the body. Everybody's essential. And we understand some people cannot make it to church. And we understand that. And we're so glad that you're watching live stream or watching online. But those of you that can make it, we miss you and we need you. And the purpose of meeting as that body is that we can function as a body so that when one part hurts, we can come together and help that part out. If you don't attend, we don't know how we can help you. But if you attend and meet here with us on Sundays, meet with us at other times, then we can share one another's burdens. We can be the church. We can be the body of Christ. That's freedom. That's the freedoms that come through worship God and following our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And of course, the ultimate freedom that we talk about is the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins. And he freed us from the bonds of slavery to sin. That's the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. That's the freedom we have in God. That's the freedom we have in the church. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we as people see the difficulty in, in living out this teaching. And you as God, you as the Father, you understand our difficulties. And, and we have to remember that. Jesus literally walked in our shoes. Jesus lived our problems. And he was sinless because he was all God and all human. Something that we don't understand. But Father, thank you for Jesus. We just pray for your help and your strength. We pray for those, Father, that don't have the physical ability to be here with us. And we pray for those that can be with us that just aren't coming. And we reach out to them in love, Father, begging them to come begging them to be a part of the body, whether it's here or someplace else. Yes, we'd love everyone to come here, Father, but at the same time, we're not the only body of believers. There's others that are just as viable. So, Father, grow your church. Grow the church of Jesus. And may it happen through us. And, Father, thank you for our freedoms in our nation of 246 years. Thank you for our freedoms as a congregation of 125 years. And thank you for the freedoms in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscopchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.